goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness. Aren't you grateful that he is faithful and he is good? And we gather this morning to worship him, our Lord and Savior. It is good to see you. We're glad that you've come to worship with us today. It is first Sunday, so we have potluck lunch. If you would like to stay, you are most welcome. And next Sunday, the church board meets after our morning worship. And then that evening, if you are coming to watch the Super Bowl with us, we'll be here at the church at 5 o'clock. I believe the game is scheduled to start at 5.30. We just ask that if you're coming, bring whatever food, snacks, drinks that you want to have on hand for that. And we'll fellowship together. We have our church elections coming up on February 26th. And then that evening is our spaghetti dinner and trivia. So the spaghetti will be supplied by the church. We're asking that you bring a dessert or drink if you're coming. And we're going to have some team trivia after the meal. So if that sounds like fun for you, we do ask that you sign up either in the back or just send a message so that you can let me know so that we can plan for our meal <coughs> accordingly. And that is at 530 that evening. Bring a friend. Hmm? Bring a friend. Bring a friend. Sure, bring a friend. Well, this morning as we do worship, I invite you to stand and we will read responsively from the hymnal, page 715, 715. If you find a hymnal and share with a neighbor and we will read responsively the words in bold. Let's worship together. Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. That you may declare the praises of him, called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Live as children of light. Amen. It is good to be with you this morning. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are indeed thankful to gather in your house, together with your people, to praise your name. We sense your presence. We anticipate all that you would do for us today. But we ask, come Holy Spirit, empower us that we might be able to give to you the worship you so richly deserve from our hearts to yours. Accept this sacrifice of praise and use this time, we pray, to shape and mold us into the very image and likeness of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Good morning, y'all. We're starting with 694. 694. <laughs> The joyful sound Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves, onward tis our Lord's command. 
Those who've been asked would come prepare to wait on us for our morning offerings. Thank you, ladies. Let's pray together this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are indeed thankful that we can participate in your work. We ask that you would bless today both gift and giver and make us here in this church good stewards of these resources that we might use them to do your work in our world. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.
Good morning. Good morning. You know, man, I have seen what Miss Michelle has in store. So if you are three years old through sixth grade, that's right. Y'all know. Let's do it. I'm telling you what. I'm excited. I get to take a part of this one. Yes. Don't tell Miss Michelle she left, but I've already had a piece of candy too. Well, it is good to see y'all. Don't forget to say good morning to one another. I'm gonna go back here and play the key. <laughs> This morning, as we turn our hearts toward prayer, I would ask if you would be thinking of those who you might want to request prayer for, here are our established list. Continue to pray for the unrest in our world, especially the fighting we see going on in the Ukraine, our nation's leaders, those serving in our armed forces, law enforcement agents, first responders. Pray for Dorothy. Keep Reddick in our prayers. Remember to pray for Brenda and Cindy, for Bailey, for Carly, for Scott. Uh, remember Andy Thompson, who was in the hospital most of the week, is home now. We're praying that the Lord will touch him and raise him to health. Uh, pray for Martha Hay as uh, she's anticipating surgery. Pray for Sean, um, who's not with us today, who's been having some health issues are there others that you would mention to this? April. Remember April? Remember Madeline? Pray for Celine. Pray for Tom Walker. Unspoken prayer request you might want to indicate today. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, first we say thank you for hearing us when we call upon you. It is with awe and trepidation that we come into your presence. And with the boldness that the Holy Spirit gives us, according to your word, to have an audience with the Most High and to make our needs known. And so today we come before you and we mention these things that we gather together and pray about. The unrest we see in our world, the fighting and war, how we pray for its cessation for those who we have elected to lead our nation and our states and our cities, that they may govern us well. How we pray today for our soldiers and sailors and airmen, those serving as Marines and Coast Guard. We pray for their safety and well-being. For those who serve us as first responders, our law enforcement officers, our firefighters, our EMTs. We pray your protection upon them. We ask that your hand of healing would be with Dorothy, with Reddick, Brenda and Cindy, with Bailey, and with Carly, and with Scott. We ask that you would touch Andy. We pray that you would be with Sean and Tom. We pray that you would strengthen Celine and Madeline and help them in their recoveries. We pray for good results for April. 
We pray that you would prepare Martha's body for surgery and that you would help her to recover quickly and completely. And today we pause and lift from our hearts those things we've not spoken out loud, but we trust that you know. Then we ask that you would speak to us in the remainder of this service, that your word would speak truth to our hearts that would shape and mold us into the very image and likeness of Jesus Christ, that we may know and do your will. Bless this time for your purposes. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. If you have your Bibles today, I would ask that you find the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 13, that's where we will start today. Not sure whether to call this a short or a long scripture reading, maybe it's right in the middle, maybe it's just medium, which I'm not sure how that functions in the preacher's rule, so anything goes. Long, short, or something in the middle. Should we take a vote? Let's not do that. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 13, hear the word of the Lord. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting the lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Just where to begin? Because it just begins out of nowhere. You are the salt of the earth. Jesus speaking to those Listening to him in this great sermon, he gets to a point and he says, you are the salt of the earth. No explanation, no real diving into, okay, this is what I mean. No later explanation to his uh, disciples, to his, uh, you know, speaking to them about the what does this mean? How, how do I understand this? He just throws it out there. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? Well, apparently, this statement didn't need explanation. When Jesus said it, it didn't need to be explained. Maybe that's the way it is today and we should just move on. Not what you expect. Okay. I don't either. I think it needs some explanation in our day and time because we take salt for granted. It's on our tables and we take what the ancient world did with salt. 
so for granted these days. It, it just doesn't communicate to us, and so I think it needs some explanation. Salt is a multifunctional substance in the ancient world. It has all kinds of purposes, not the least of which in this context, I think, are its preservative qualities and its disinfectant qualities. How it acts to preserve and then disinfect. Um, some of you know we, we are country folk enough to understand salt-cured ham, a.k.a. real country ham, right? None of that sugar-cured stuff that isn't really, you know, right, right? At least the old-timers might say that, you know. Um, although I really think that that whole business was about just preserving the meat so we could have it later on, and how you did that was sort of irrelevant just so long as you preserved it, and we've gotten better at that, and that's okay. Freezing is okay. Salt or sugar cured works okay. But in the ancient world, they had salt. You could mine salt. You could make salt. Um, they mined salt. Um, they, as far as uh, in Africa and brought it into the Middle East, they had a great source of salt at the Dead Sea, although there's lots of other trace elements there, and sometimes it's not the best salt in the world. And they had the Mediterranean Sea, and they knew that you could use an evaporative technique to produce salt. It was a big deal. Salt was an industry, and salt was used to preserve meats, to preserve foods of all kinds, and it was understood for its medicinal, i.e. its disinfecting quality. So when Jesus said to those listening to him, who, those who are accepting his message, you are the salt of the earth, I think all of those things immediately clicked in their heads. Okay, we are going to be a preserving agent in our world. Certainly within the Jewish elements, which were, remember, the vast majority of people listening to Jesus when he was preaching, they understood the concept of a remnant, a small group of faithful people who continued to keep the law of God and by doing so preserved a nation. I think they just got that. You're the salt of the earth. You, as you follow Jesus, as you live as his disciple, become a preserving agent in our world. You're holding back evil in our world. And maybe you don't even know how much you're doing that. I think of all of the different walks of life that we represent, all of the different jobs and all of the different interactions, all of the different places you go throughout your week. And as you are in those places, right from the schoolhouse to the factory, to the business office, maybe even to the bowling alley. You are a little bit of Christ in that place. And your presence has an effect. Fighting the forces of evil, bringing the peace of God into other people's lives, bringing the voice of the gospel through how you live and what you say, and maybe mostly through how you live and conduct yourself in that environment. So remember, Jesus said, you are the salt of the world. And don't forget the disinfecting qualities, right? You might actually be a cleansing agent wherever you go. Helping to clean up. Can I use an old-fashioned word? Helping to 
to push back, to mop up some of the filth of our world. So keep up, keep it up. Be salt. Wherever you can be salt. It's very interesting this this phrase. But if salt loses its saltiness, how does salt lose its saltiness? Have you ever had salt that wasn't salty? Me either. Uh, so maybe I have to stretch a little bit and figure out what salt that loses its saltiness really means. It's very interesting to me that the Greek word that Jesus uses here for loses its saltiness has the has this root, moron. Everybody know that word? You're not supposed to use it anymore, right? Um, it, it really means fool or foolishness. And this word loses its saltiness, could also be translated, becomes foolish. If you're the salt of the earth, How would you become foolish? Well, I would say maybe this is Jesus warning those who would follow him that if you're not striving to be consistent, that if you're not walking the talk, does that communicate? If you're not living what you say you believe, if you're not somehow demonstrating the ethics of the kingdom of God, you just sort of don't matter. You're not salt anymore. You've become foolish. You do what you want to with the thrown out and trampled business. That's a warning from... Uh, Jesus, to all of us who would follow him, that we have to keep following. Jesus moves on from the metaphor of salt to light. And he adds just a little bit of explanation there. Thank you, Jesus. I mean that literally. Thank you for giving us some explanation. It helps. Light seems to be a, a sort of universal religious symbol used by just pretty much every religion. And it represents this idea of purity or truth instead of falsehood. Light signifies knowledge and even the presence of the divine. We still light candles on Sunday morning as a symbol, a visible reminder that God's presence is here with us. The light and even the fire of the Holy Spirit is here and welcomed here. And what do you do with a light? Jesus makes it clear. Well, you don't light a light and hide it under a bushel basket. No. Remember the song? No. I always want to say that kind of loud and quick. No. Hide it under a bushel. No. You want to take that light and you want to hold it up. You want to put it on the lampstand. You want to, a light is meant to give light. That's why you lit the lamp. That's why God lets you be light. So you would continue to be light in those dark places. A visible reminder of the presence of God. Um, sometimes when we're talking to people who are in training for ministry, we talk to them about the, the importance of presence. And I've been reminded recently that sometimes you just have to kind of show up. You walk into a hospital room and someone who is uh, struggling sees you, the minister, as a visible representation that God's here with us. And that is a heavy burden to bear. When you really internalize 
that when you show up, it might communicate to someone that God shows up. And I'm going to give you a, a hint. We are not particularly low, but we are Protestants. <laughs> we believe in the priesthood of all believers. And while, yes, God's called me to, to a particular role, and I've trained and prepared and am in that role, you are the light of the world. Visible reminders of God's presence. The people in your workplace the people in your families, the places you go, the people you interact with will know you bear the name of Christ. And in their darkest moments, guess what? You will be a visible reminder that God shows up. You will be able to speak that truth, that encouragement, that life and light into those places you go. So don't hide that light. No. Let it shine. You don't have to be super showy. This isn't a holier-than-thou contest. It's not a who-can-look-the-most-Christian contest. Uh, but it sure does help when those who bear the name of Christ do the things of Christ, have the attitude of Christ. And maybe most importantly, are seen and known for loving people like Christ loves people. Right where they are, right in the middle of their circumstance, always with an eye toward how can we help and how can we help you be better? Hmm. He throws in this lovely little bit, which I'm also not sure we still get. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. Uh, I've always thought it would be wonderful. Some of these places I go in the woods or drive by in the wilderness, I, I look up a hillside and I think that'd be a great place for a house. But I've, I've had this dream in my life and I've, I've about at this point decided that the practice of it are, are impractical. But I've always thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to drive by one of those places and say that'd be a great place for a house and there already be one there, you just can't see it. Like it so blends in with the woods and the hills and the terrain that it's there and you, you just can't see it. Hobbit holes maybe or something. I don't know. I was probably influenced by that. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. Well, if you're in the Middle East, you're in Jesus' day and time and place, you build out of limestone primarily because that's the rock that's all around that you can quarry and build. You don't necessarily have a whole lot of trees and the ones you do aren't very big and there surely aren't enough to build houses you know, stick-built houses don't become a thing uh, until you move into places where there's lots and lots of trees and forest, and that is not Israel. Um, they had lots of rocks, though. I think the ground grows rocks. And uh, if you ever go there, you'll understand what I mean. They, there are rocks everywhere. Everywhere there's rocks. And so they would quarry this limestone in the ground. And when you quarry limestone... It's not this ugly, gray, weathered looking stuff. When you quarry limestone, it's shiny. It's white. And so you build your city out of this quarried stone, and it's white limestone. And what does white limestone do in the sun on a hilltop? Looks like a light, like somebody's shining a light. It's reflecting. You couldn't hide. If you are 
a Christian, a person following Jesus, if the light of God is in you and working in you, guess what? It's going to be obvious, especially to those who walk in darkness. Hmm? It just will be. Don't be surprised when people start wondering if there's something different about you. Praise the Lord a little bit for that. There's something a little different about those who bear the name of Christ. Sometimes it's enough different that you see one, or I see one, and you go, hmm, I think they're one of us. This happened to me in the workplace from time to time. I'd have a salesman stop by and would make their pitch and tell me about whatever new gadget or new wonderful computer thing was going on, and Something about the way they conducted themselves made me go, hmm. There's a little light shining there. And several of those folks have become, became friends. I did, I found out. I'm, yes, indeed. Jesus shining in them was recognized. I was, I was gratified that sometimes it went both ways. <laughs> That uh, I would see that light and they would see the same light and we would realize we had Jesus in common. And sometimes I just wonder, at the end of the day, when all is said and done, if we have Jesus in common, isn't that enough? <laughs> I mean, isn't that the best basis for a friendship, a relationship, two people could ever have? Maybe enough so that some of the other things that we don't have in common don't matter as much. If we got Jesus in common, yeah. Hmm. I think Jesus means for us who follow him to understand that all of these metaphors suggest that we cannot withdraw from interaction with the world no matter how bad it looks or becomes. That it's actually necessary for us to stay engaged and involved and embedded, mixed up with the world, with people who don't follow Jesus. But it's also important, remember salt and saltiness, salt and consistency it's important for us to be christ-like christians you know that's actually redundant you know it's, it's it's really the case right you know you know this right christian is just a weird coupling of two greek words which means christ-like so to be christian really is to be the ones who are like christ Today I want to conclude with Jesus' final statements in the scripture that's been read this morning, but I would like to conclude by suggesting that we should not be so quick to throw rocks at scribes and Pharisees. I know it's fun to throw rocks at scribes and Pharisees, to create an other against which we, we can be another. Push them off. And I would like to remind you that the scribes and Pharisees, and maybe especially the Pharisees in their day, were very holy and righteous looking and acting people. I know Jesus has some criticism for them. I would remind you that Jesus could see the heart. And my guess is when Jesus chose to criticize a Pharisee or a scribe, he knew exactly what he was talking about. But as a class, 
they were some of the most righteous people you could find in that society. Convinced, convicted, sold out keepers of the law. While it might be sort of fun to think that we can throw rocks at them, I just suggest don't. Instead of bringing their standard of righteousness down really low, like they're not really righteous people and Jesus wagged on them all the time, instead understand they're holy people striving to keep the law. The traditions of the Jewish people is passed down to them. They have a whole tradition. And, and you're talking about people who as a class of people knew the Bible way better than you do. Most of whom could quote large sections of what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Probably most of whom could recite most of the Psalms from memory and certainly could have quoted most of the first five books. So don't be so fast to judge and throw rocks at the Pharisees. Because you don't do much good. You don't do much good to the cause of Christ if what you do is you say, well, the, uh, the standard of righteousness is uh, so low that I don't even have to take much of a step to get above it. Right? Jesus ends up saying, your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Which I would probably suggest means Jesus recognized that there was righteousness to be seen in the scribes and Pharisees. There was something there that he said that there's a righteousness and yours has to exceed it. How can that happen? If they're so holy that they know the scriptures so well and they keep the laws, how can our righteousness exceed those kinds of people? Well, first of all, if we have to understand that righteousness flows from a right relationship with God. And those who are in the kingdom of heaven, those who first have a right relationship with God, uh, I just remind you, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, is where God is the king. Wherever you see God is the king, there's the kingdom of God. Maybe you should ask yourself right now, today, where you sit, in my kingdom, in my heart, in my home, is God king? Do we live by his rules? Is that how I order my life? Jesus does speak through the law and the prophets and them not passing away but being fulfilled in him. Right now, right where you sit, is God king of your life? Because where God is the kingdom is the kingdom of heaven, is the kingdom of God. And if you walk in right relationship with God, your righteousness comes from God. Righteousness doesn't come from doing all the right things. It comes from your right relationship with God. But, I just don't ever want to, I don't ever want to be misunderstood here. Yes, righteousness comes from right relationship with God. It comes through a right relationship with God, which is through Jesus Christ. We follow Jesus, we become rightly related to God through him. He in whom the law is not abolished but fulfilled. But that doesn't mean the stuff we find in the Bible, especially the stuff we find in the Old Testament, which some people may want to ignore. 
We can't just ignore that. It, it's like it still matters. The character of God is revealed to us in Scripture. How we should order our lives is revealed to us in Scripture. It is a foundation on which we build our lives. Just don't get the cart before the horse. Okay? I think that those scribes and Pharisees that Jesus criticizes are the ones who got the cart before the horse. Who thought, well, I do all the right things. So I'm okay. I think Jesus will use the phrase whitewashed sepulchers. You look pretty on the outside, but inside you're full of dead man's bones. It isn't that you do good your way to heaven and you don't do good your way to righteousness. You follow Jesus. You get into right relationship with Jesus. You begin to strive to allow the Holy Spirit to make you more and more like Christ. And something's going to happen when you do that. If God is at work inside of you, guess what's going to happen? You're going to start behaving in ways which are pleasing to God. And it's going to be interesting because those manifestations of the grace of God at work in you are going to look a lot like the character revealed in Scripture. You ever hear of the Ten Commandments? God expects you to manifest those in your life, to behave that way, to do and not do those things. Is that how you walk? Is that how you live? If the answer is yes... Praise the Lord. And you might convince me that God rules there. <laughs> that he's the king. Where I start seeing those things happening. Are they not going on? And Maybe you need to ask yourself. Is God really king here? If you struggle with those things that the Word of God reveals as sinful, as wrong, as antithetical to God, maybe you need to ask the question, is God really king here? Because where God rules, the heart that is surrendered to the kingship of God looks more and more like Jesus who didn't abolish all that had come before but fulfilled it. Let's pray together this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father today We give you praise and thanks that you have given to us a written guide so that we might know what a godly person looks like. That we might have instructions as to how we should live. We might know from your law what true life looks like. And so today I pray for those who listen and those who hear.
that they would be so surrendered to the work and grace poured out to us in Jesus Christ that in fact, indeed, your truth will be manifested not only in right relationship with God through Christ, but in upright, holy living. In a clean heart and clean hands who look to your word to know how to conduct ourselves and see that us and those who follow Jesus become more and more like Jesus. Help us today, I pray, to not only call ourselves, but to be Christian. Bless now, I pray, those who have come into your house. Be a blessing out for each one, fit for their needs in this week. Allow your spirit to guide us and strengthen us and help us to surrender to your spirit and its guidance today and always. And I pray that the blessed presence of God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will be with you today and always. Amen. Please don't forget, dinner follows, table fellowship, and...